everybody. Welcome to Habitat Now. I'm your host, Aaron Shea, and I am joined today by Habitat's founder, Ferdinand Hampson, who, who it's an honor to have. And with a concept like this, talking about a bunch, bunch of uh, the works that are coming up in our upcoming auction down in uh, Sarasota, I'm eager to hear many of his stories about the pieces that we're going to be looking at. This is a very informal talk. We're looking forward to your questions and interactions. Maybe you have work similar that you can join in and share. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, and I'll talk a little bit about our upcoming Glass Coast Weekend, which is coming up here fast. I'm looking forward to seeing many of your faces as we travel down to Florida and enjoy the warm weather because we are not having it here in Michigan. So <laughs> first and foremost, our title card. Let's put that in place. So everybody knows they're the first contemporary glass art gallery. We're going through some rebranding too. We're going to be calling ourselves Habitat Detroit Fine Art. There's a whole bunch of reasons we're doing that, which I won't go into, but I'll talk to you about it more later. For now, we're going to talk about the Glass Coast Weekend. So it is the end of January. We're already in January. We're halfway through January. And there's three shows that are going to be on display in this space. And it is rented in the Ringling College of Art and Design. We're taking one of their uh, sound stages, which is incredible, 30 foot tall ceilings, black walls. It's almost as if it was made for us and putting up three shows. The first is called Beyond the Ceiling, Influential Women in Glass. We have about 20, I think it's 21 women who are a finalist, 21 women working in the medium who are in, very important and are putting on uh, an incredible exhibition. And it's gonna be, it's a continuation of the Muskegon Museum's exhibition um, in our own style with our own Habitat family. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. Next is Aquatica, which is glass beneath the waves. Uh, artists who are inspired by the underwater world, whether it's life or terrain or nature or the water itself. There's about, I think about 30 artists in this show selling or offering multiple pieces each. So it's gonna be in a, one of those things that knock your socks right off. And then we have a solo exhibition with artist Shelly Allen, who will also be doing our demonstration at the Ringling College. And she has some amazing and uh, very innovative works that I'm excited about that this is one of them. This is almost full life size of a pony, which will be mounted to the wall. And I just wanna share one of these things. I wanted to show you real quickly before I click over to Martin Blank, um, the Glass Coast Weekend site is up. Uh, GlassCoastWeekend.com has all the details. And inevitably, if since a lot of people won't be able to join us, you can actually view the exhibitions on this page and see the artwork itself. And there's a link to our auction and to the Imagine Museum who is co-sponsoring the weekend. And you also have our hours for people who want to come see it, who don't want to participate in the full event because they can't because their own, own issues or things they have going on in their lives. So let me kick back into this presentation. Okay. All right. So then we're going to be honoring Martin Blank at the Imagine Museum. He's going to have an amazing installation that's going to be just, uh, unveiled and he'll be there giving a talk and giving a talk to our members as well. So looking forward to seeing many of you then. You probably have seen this before. I'm just going to kick over it. Um, and I'll kick over that too. So, oh, there'll be 15 artists in attendance too um, at the show. So there'll be a good amount of our Habitat family members down there besides our clientele. So it's gonna be a great time to see a lot of people. Um, the Year of Glass, many of you know about this. So it's one, the year 2022, we're celebrating the Year of Glass and all its aspects. So lots of events going on. They covered a lot of the stuff uh, in yesterday's ACG meeting for those who are able to join. If not, it's on YouTube, I'm gonna be watching it again. So the auction. The auction's up on Live Auctioneers. Many of you have the auction catalog. I have mine right here. If it doesn't disappear in my background, um, there's a lot of impressive pieces in this auction. And I'm so excited about doing it live and in person. If you want to bid online, you're welcome to. If you want to bid on the phone or bid with silent bids, you're welcome to call me up and get in contact with me. The premium is less if you bid through the gallery versus the online system. So here's the art card. And here's the first piece. Um, this is kind of a very innovative and interesting piece by artist Paul Stankard. And actually Debbie called him on the phone and talked to him about this. And he made, he said he can only remember making two of these or two or three of these Medusa like Paul Stankard's work, Paul Stankard works. And the up the top of it has a bouquet of flowers or, but the bottom of it is where the real money is seeing all these snakes. And I saw one of these sell in a different auction. You can see the results somewhere online just typing in Paul Stankard Medusa, but this one's a lot nicer and came from a later body of work. And uh, I'm honored to have this one on our show. We have a few, few Paul Stankards, but this one's just such an interesting narrative. I'm really excited about it. And that's the first piece in our auction to get things a rolling. Um, Marquis, Ferd wanted to talk about this one. You join me, Ferd. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Aaron. Uh, this is uh, from 1989, but <clears throat> I just wanted to mention Richard Marquis, obviously one of the uh, real notable artists in America working with glass, but it's so interesting that it, uh, a dealer from Venice uh, that it was, was involved in glass cited him as being the best at these techniques, which was quite startling because these techniques are all Italian techniques, many of them emanating from Venice and, and um, Murano. Yeah, it, uh, we've yeah. had a good amount of these Marquez teapots through our auction and they always have quite uh, in a, little, a good amount of interest, but they're always such treasures. And I'm a big mm -hmm. fan of this body of work. And I think we have two teapots in the auction and then we have uh, a bell will come up to next and a, um, a noble effort it's called. This is a fun work. Many of you uh, attended the ACG visit to Elizabeth Sterling's studio and this is a large one. This is, can we see how tall this piece? Let me pull the catalog open in front of me. You can always ask me too, if you want the sizes. I think it's 17 and a half, right? For it's quite a large, largest one I've ever seen. And it has a quite beautiful uh, etched imagery on the sides of it. And um, this kind of ties back into the women's show we'll be doing it. There's a lot of uh, important artists who, female artists working in the medium and she was definitely one of them. We don't we don't represent her directly all the time. Every now and then we have her in shows, but we're grateful to have this one in our auction, and it is quite a masterpiece. I think this is an example of how art made by women can be different than art made by men. I've always been reluctant to have a show of artists working in glass that were women because I felt it actually segregated them from the body of artists working with glass. But as years passed, I've watched how that work, sometimes so incredibly sensitive that, that you can almost quite often tell that a female made it as opposed to a male. So that's part of what this show is going to be uh, reviewing uh, in Florida and Sarasota. Yeah, that's a great point, Ferg. Thanks for sharing. Um, Leah Wingfield, part of her African series, Ferd was around during this particular body of work. Would you join me, Ferd? Yeah, that was around prior to this body of work. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is a, uh, was when Leah Wingfield first became really known. This African series was one of the most coveted series that she created. We always had like an enormous waiting list for, for this series. And of course, she stopped making them and went on to an, another series, the Tango series, which also was very popular. But this is a beautiful example of her work. Aaron, I noticed in the catalog, it said that it had been repaired. Um, could you elaborate on that? Sure. The bottom of her foot on the outer leg had a deep scratch in it that we had to ask Leah how to repair. And with instructions by her and buying a couple of um, glass-like for lack of a better term, glass sandpaper, we're able to get the scratch out. So it didn't affect the overall look of the piece or the design of the piece. We just wanted to make sure it was up to the artist standards. And after showing it to Leah, she was very happy with the results. So that's what that's about. Great. Eric Hilton, I think you wanted this one too, Ferd. Well, yeah, I'm not going to do this with every piece, but these <laughs> are also sensational. <laughs> uh, this Eric Hilton piece is done with dichroic glass, which means that as you look at it in different angles, the colors change. Or if you look at it from the back to the front, it changes. But look at the elaborate cutting everywhere. And then note the base. Even the base is glass that's been cut and polished uh, in his. Uh, amazing amount of uh, effort in an individual piece. This is really a, a strong one. I'm, I'm very proud that we have this in the auction. Yeah, this was from which collection? Let me look at the catalog here. So this is from the uh, David and Joanne Dunn collection. We've been offering their collection for a while now. Um, they had a great eye for pieces and these pieces lived within, I think about maybe eight miles of the gallery. So we're actually able to go over there personally and pick them up. This is two separate pieces, the base and the, the topper, which slides in. And then Fred is right. It does change in appearance of dichroic glass as you move around the piece. 
it is a fine work. And you might have seen Eric talk recently. He's doing a lot of the videography work with his partner. His name escapes me, but it'll come to me when I'm not watching. So this is a classic Eric Hilton and a great friendly collection. Um, this Davide Salvadori, many of you have seen this before. We put it at auction in the past, but having it in a live auction is really going to help. It is a uh, masterpiece. It is huge. I think it's like 56 inches tall. It would help. If I yeah, it's over five this. feet tall. Oh, yeah, 64 inches tall. Mm -hmm. So it is a massive work by the legendary artist from Italy. Oh, his instrument series, I think it's called a uh, Tyra Basson. Um, this is a museum quality piece by far. If you're looking for a Davide Salvadori, that is an absolute masterpiece. This is the piece to get. It is priced very well. The seller is actually donating the, the um, profit from the sale to her local temple and to her rabbi. So it's going to a good cause uh, after the sale. So keep your eye on it. Um, Dale Chihuly, everybody knows this guy. This is a unique piece by Dale. Um, quite a beautiful example of the work from the historic body of work. And Ferb is going to mention, this was actually from my grandmother's collection. The, the family is selling it in the estate. And uh, Ferb, did you sell this to my grandma? Oh, yeah, yes, I did. A lot of fond memories about her and, and her husband acquiring pieces. Um, this, this one is this little big piece. It's just wonderful. I always enjoyed going over and seeing it. And I pointed out to her as a piece that she should get at the time when she acquired it. Yeah, so it's 94, but definitely unique, not an addition. Julie has a great name at auction. People are always diving on them, especially institutions um, starting their own collections. Another artist that we show a lot at auction, but every time we show one of these, they get more and more uh, uh, just stunning and beautiful. This perfume bottle has both toppers. Sometimes we get the man, there's only one topper missing or there's issues, this one's in perfect condition. Only one topper comes out because it is technically a perfume bottle. But look at that beautiful gray uh, carving inside that glass and look at the reflection. This is probably one of the nicest, uh, perfume bottles by uh, William Carlson I've seen. The harmony is just beautiful in terms of the color and the granite and the glass. Yeah, beautiful. I, I, I agree. Even that, that thin gray line that separates the tones, it's, a, it's just a beauty. An older John Kuhn. Um, so many of you are familiar with John Kuhn's work over the years. And if you're me, you see them every day. You see the different bodies of work that uh, turned into what he offers today, which is that you'll see in the next piece. But this is a transitional piece called Totem. Um, it's about 16 inches tall, and you can kind of see it coming together towards his newer body of work. It is a, a beautiful piece. The colors are absolutely spectacular. And a lot of the work he creates now is, has uh, speckles of color here and there, but this is, this is kind of uh, just a beautiful colorful work and it will be great in front of a window. Um, an important part of the history of John, which leads to the next piece, which is something you'll recognize more. This was a piece called Vista. And we picked this up at a client's house in Chicago who was moving and selling his collection. This is a, a, a nine inch piece uh, and a perfect example of his work at the scale. It doesn't have a twister on the bottom. So it's kind of stationary, but it could be, it's kind of interesting in that way because it doesn't have that kind of thing. Beautiful colors inside of it, reds, and it reflects like John's work. And I suspect this will have a lot of attention at auction as he always does. Gabrielle Kunzner um, from Germany. We had a piece of her sell in our last auction during our glass, our uh, Habitat 50th anniversary in September, which was our last in-person event. And it sold for a good amount of money and I'm happy we found it. We're big fans of her work. She's a master of color and a master of her process, which is fused glass. And this thing mounts to the wall. So this was purchased from the gallery here in Michigan and lived for, I would say maybe, let's see, to about 15 years in the client's home. And then we went and pick it up because they were moving. And it, each piece has a bracket, it sits in place. And uh, it's, just, it's just a stunning work. Moving on, oops, I went too far, here we go. Here we go. This is another great piece that we, yeah. a rare piece we have at auction by our, our friend, Sidney Hutter. Now, according to Sid, there's only two pieces like this. And I used to know where the other one was, but of course it escapes me when I need the information. 
but look at the look at the color on that thing look at the layers and the meticulousness that's required by the mad scientist himself to create this giant work and it's it's very big it's 17 inches and a half inches tall by 13 and a half inches wide and having this live in person will really add to the add to the effect of the auction this is a uh and a nice interpretation of his work because he's always used the vessel as a format, but it's also tongue in cheek because the vessel never could be used. It's always been uh, a, a sculpture, but this one, you almost see like two vessels in it. And then of course, with all of these colors, uh, it, it is a very unusual and a very, very beautiful piece of his. Yeah, I would say it's one of the nicest I've seen especially at the scale. The other Marquis work, some fun stuff. The collector we got the other Marquises from was a big fan of Richard's and acquired these two. One has got dinner bell with an elephant on top. The other one's called a noble effort. Um, you can see his use of Marini and Kane in these particular works. And you can see his work at many museums. I see it, saw it recently at Tufango at the Henry Ford Museum. They have a couple of his pieces there. And these are kind of different from the teapot forms, but he makes a lot of work that's different from the teapot forms. Yeah, this so, is an early Iran, and it? Noble Effort was the name of his company because he wanted to do a production company as many of the artists in California were doing. And they were making a fortune. They were driving Porsches and <laughs> drugs and stuff. Anyway, they uh, he decided to uh, open up Noble Effort but he was too damn good of an artist. He just made every piece so unique and so special that um, they were indeed noble efforts. Right, right, right. A guitar on that one. Bugs, very yeah. fun. Uh, Laura Donifer, she, she'll be sending a couple new pieces in for our exhibition in the Glass Coast Weekend down in Florida. The same scale as this piece. They, the other ones are going to be, I think, orange and purple, and this blue one will be available to the highest bidder. This was also from my family's collection in the estate, and her work is usually in demand, especially at the size. And if you like blue, this is the one for you. <laughs> Carla Trinkley. Do you know if she's still alive, Ferd? I know she's not working anymore. How much about uh, her? Yes, she's married to Willie Dexter, mm -hmm. uh, another artist. You live in Florida. And uh, she really was like the first American to make pot de verre a well-known uh, process in working with glass. She always got this ancient quality to them, which created a mystery in the work. Uh, this is a great example. This is from the Belkin collection. They had really wonderful uh, works, became familiar and friendly with so many of the artists and uh, we're able to get some just significant pieces. Yeah, this is one of the nicest one I've seen, quite substantial at 16 and a half inches across. It is quite a beauty. I love the way it glows underneath too. Nice if my computer would stop changing for me. Here we go. All right, so <laughs> Pava Halava, one of the uh, early pioneers of glass in the Czech Republic. I love the way this piece illuminates through it. You've seen some of his forms and blown objects in the past, but this one just catches my attention with the, the different coloring and the, the purity of it. And I could ramble on about the history of the artist and his family, who's also artist. His granddaughter is in our NGG exhibition this year. Her name is Morag, and she creates artwork, artwork in, in, inspired by her children and their special needs. But this particular work is just, just something I could easily live with and really enjoy, especially being the historic artist he is. I, uh, this work is actually um, done on the end of a blowpipe, the black with the line work in it. Mm -hmm. And then it's been cut apart and these uh, colors, the cast glass colors have been laminated into it. And when everybody in the Czech Republic, nearly everybody was doing casting work, uh, he was used a decidedly different direction. And this is a great example of that. Yeah, thank you for it. I can definitely see the blown part of it now. Two, not just one, but two William Morris uh, vessel forms. One that lays on its side and one that stands straight up. They fit really well together, as Ferd has reminded me multiple times. So we decided to put them together in the auction. 
and they are it's you know the beautiful tones and colors of the work and at um the the vessel form is 18 inches tall and the laying down it's called a stone is 10 27 inches wide but they look pretty incredible together and uh i see William you almost Morris. get this feeling of the water with the mm -hmm. way he created the line work on the surfaces of it. So you've got this optical effect. It's really wonderful. Yeah, really wonderful indeed. And these works, you know, are different from his artifact works, but they're still a demand and effect of mm -hmm. the history of the artist. Speaking of the artifact works, we have a large, I think I've the terminology for this one, uh, artifacts tusk and skull one of these sold not too long ago i think at a different auction house and we just happened to have one for our auction big substantial work at um 31 inches tall i'm eager to see where this hammer's at i suspect it'll have a lot of attention because this kind of work does usually receive a lot of attention i got a little story sure. <laughs> go ahead Perfect. we did a show called crystal la mancia which took place at the Tamayo Museum and the Marcos Museum in Mexico. And uh, it, uh, some of the artists were a little reluctant, thinking, they were, you know, how well would their work be protected? And the uh, people that I worked with assured me that no one had stolen a piece for several years out of a, uh, any museum in Mexico, uh, mainly because of their armed guards with huge machine guns. But... Uh, Somebody stole a skull from Bill Morris's piece that we had on display there. And I was very sad to call Bill Morris and explain it to him. And he said, well, I don't know if that's bad or if it's an honor. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way of seeing that kind of uh, scenario. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now they're glued on. So good luck getting them off there. <laughs> and Wolf. A fun vessel form. We've had a couple of these in our auctions in the past using uh, these simple objects etched into the glass. This one's a teapot. I think we, in the auction we did last time, we had an in person auction in 2020. There was a chair. So it, it's nice to see such pure forms created by such a legendary artist. Another Paul Stankard. This one we did the up down shot to give you an overall view of these root people hidden in the bottom of Paul Stankard's. Um, paperweights. Paul, as you know, is one of the best in the world, if not the best. And because of the Belkin collection, we have a, a vast array of available work. And so we get to kind of cherry pick. People get to cherry pick when they come in, but we can also cherry pick for their auction. And this particular work just caught my eye right away. And I wanted Dan Fox to shoot it for this auction and just give an overall idea of how much is in this work. A lot of people like to get the bees, right, Ferd? The bees yeah. inside the vessel, but this is pre predates that. I believe that uh, this style. is this is, yeah, this is a great piece. I, I just wanted to mention the Balkan collection was the largest collection of Paul Stankards in the world, and he would give Paul money at the beginning of each year to be able to get the greatest works that were available. And they had a wonderful relationship, obviously, and um, Paul would, it would allow Paul to experiment. And so a lot of the pieces are so unique that we're in the Belkin collection, this being one of them. Yes, thank you for um, This is a Mark Pizer piece from the same collection we picked up the Marquises from. This, what is this? There's a, a name for this body of work, right, Ferd? I think it was like, um, if I wrote it down, Inner Space, Inner Space series. So this piece, is just a beauty, beautiful tones and yeah. color and the shape. We do rather well with this one. It's mentioned that the work has had a repair done to it, which is unnoticeable. I didn't see it. It might've been some kind of small little scratch or something that the clients fixed before I even got there to pick up the piece. So it, 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 it's nominal in some way, but it is just a beautiful, beautiful work. And I think it looks perfect. And everybody loves Mark. He is, he's a, He's a pioneer in the glass art world. And I had a uh, Habitat Now scheduled with him. And then um, uh, the Talking Out Your Glass, which is a, a blog, many of you may know, a, a podcast, jumped in and swooped in and talked to him first. And then I brought it back up. He told me he was enjoying his life after glass and didn't want to do the talk. And I said, okay, Paul, you deserve it. <laughs> no big deal. Enjoy yourself. I'll talk to you soon. 
Uh, Jenny Ruffner, this is a fun one. It has a crazy name too. Uh, de debate over the origin of the planets from 1987. And you can see the planets down there on the bottom. What a, what a, what a creative, isn't she, Ferd? <laughs> oh yeah, just amazing. Uh, this one predates her terrible accident she had, car accident, right. and uh, which uh, she still worked because she's just such a brilliant artist. Uh, but this piece was lamp work and it was done all by her. Now she uh, uses assistants, which there's nothing wrong with that, but um, these are very desirable works. Yeah, and very fun. It's something you can easily talk about constantly. Like, why are these people's heads all different? But <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan. It's a great shot. The, the center color is just beautiful. Uh, Javier Gomez, he is out of Spain and he is one of the in most innovative artists I've seen working today. We have him in our Aquatica show in, Sar in Sarasota. And he started off originally doing single color pieces. And this is, this is a quite a wide piece. I believe it's 22 inches wide. I had to pick this piece up to bring it in the gallery from a local collector who's selling it because they bought a Steve Weinberg for the place that this piece went. So I figured, sure, we'll bring it in. And he had the crate for it in his basement. It was perfect for uh, consignment. Beautiful work, lots of lines all laminated together. He is one of the best I've seen, I'm a big fan. Uh, museum quality Richard Jolly. This is one we've had an auction before, but having it live and in person for the first time. Now, all black glass that is called Dome 2 from 2008. And this monster is 40 inches tall. So this is a real substantial work by the artist. We actually got it in consignment from a collector in New York who I, th I don't know why he was selling off his collection, but he, was, he gave us a bunch of substantial pieces that we've been selling over time. But this is probably the most substantial out of all of them. I know Richard Jolly is really known for his forms and colors, yeah. but they're not all colorful. But this is a, a true museum quality piece. Or do you have anything to say about the Irwin Eich phone, the body of work? Yeah, I sure do. <laughs> Great. In, uh, in 1971, the uh, Corning Museum acquired the, a gold phone. And I'm not sure if it was the very first one that he made, but I think it was. And uh, it was important, significant for a couple of reasons. One is that it really linked with the um, pop art movement uh, that was going on in uh, the United States and in Europe. And then secondly, it really revealed to artists that you didn't have to make glass transparent. You could make it opaque and really work on the surface, uh, which allowed to sometimes make great sculpture that would be recognized as a bronze or any other material. Now, this one is one of 15 because French. I convinced Erwin that, um, I, that Habitat would love to have How are you? I'm gonna find out who's off, who's not muted. Give me one second. Yep. Go ahead for fixed. And uh, so uh, this is one of the 15 pieces that was created uh, at that time. I, it's one of the most publicized uh, works in, in studio glass in the world today because Eich was so significant, not just in Germany, not just in Europe, but throughout the United States. Because as Harvey Littleton said, he added the poetry to the glass. Very nice, for This also is the first out of the 15 and does oh. come with the original box. So it is labeled number one. So it's nice to see when the very first edition appears in the market. Many of you know artist Christina Bothwell. We have been representing her for a while and a couple of years back, she had a fire that took out her studio and with the help of the community and with surf, she was able to rebuild her studio again and get back to work. This, her work focuses on the family and uh, motherhood and she ties into the dream world a lot in the spiritual realm. And this particular piece came in uh, from a client and the one of the toes had fallen off the piece so I contacted Christina and she said, send it to me, I'll, I'll, I'll fix the toe. Lo and behold, she like perfected and increased the quality of the entire piece without me asking. 
and didn't charge anything for it because she wanted to make sure the work was up to her standards. Sent it back to us and we put it at auction. It's now perfect reconditioned from the artist herself and available at auction. Here is a Emma Varga work from uh, Australia acquired from the Savia Gallery from a collector who lives here locally and has had a relationship with the Toledo Museum of Art and constantly traveled to Australia. Um, a beautiful work exploring nature. Many of you may have met her at the sofa shows and whatnot. It's, a, it's quite substantial again. I think it is a uh, heavier one at 15 and a quarter inches across. It is a beauty. You can almost see the coral. Probably would fit in our Aquatica show if it wasn't an auction. <laughs> Everybody asks, calls every now and then asking me if I have any Denny Perkins available. And Denny has retired from creating. And so now I have one available. Who'd have thought? There is a 42 inch vessel form. And a lot of people ask when they see these works, if they're broken, if they're made specifically like this with the parts removed. And they are, their parts have been laminated together. So they are designed exactly to be like this. And they have a stand, they mount, they're very colorful and they're amazing in natural light. Um, he, well, he breaks the piece apart and then uses each piece as almost like an individual painting and then reassembles the parts. They're right. really, really a wonderful technique. I'm sorry that he retired. It's great work. Yeah, it's like a staple of a, a glass collection. Everybody at least should have one, uh, especially <laughs> a tall one. And that brings me to uh, the masterpiece I have on the auction by our friend Paul Stankard. This is a uh, nine piece botanical earth and spirit weight. So the sister piece to this, this is also from the Belkin collection, was acquired by the Fort Wayne, Museum, Fort Wayne Museum of Art, which had a black background. This one is translucent and clear. It has multiple different uh, designs through the entire thing, exploring nature. It is a true masterpiece. And I mean, I, I try to fit as much provenance as I could in the auction catalog. It's been at so many museums. Um, Ferd told me to cut some of the provenance out. It's getting a little crazy on some of these because of how many places the Belkins lent their parts of their collection to. But this is definitely a museum quality masterpiece and uh, someone is gonna have a, own it someday and take it home. Due to Schechter, we had a talk with her, the AACG, I believe, visiting her studio. Maybe it was a fired up had a chance to interact with her and talk about her work. She has a few hardcover books discussing her technique and her career and her works, you know, aren't the most uplifting in appearance, but they have a lot of depth to the story. And so we've had this, a, go ahead for Oh, I said they're just so sensitive. So <laughs> sensitive, yeah. And yeah. this one's quite impressive at 43 inches tall. Uh, and we're honored to have it in this exhibition and this in this auction and we'll hope it We'll find a home for sure and we're just honored to have her because she's an important cornerstone of the world of contemporary art glass today. Uh, another Chihuly, this is a, let me see, a Portland Press edition from 97, eight inches tall, seven and change wide. Uh, another one from my family's estate. Bert, I assume you sold this one to yes. uh, as yeah. well, which is great. So we these editions do rather well at auction, so that's why I like to include them when they come available. And if you ever have an edition piece you're looking to offer, feel free to contact me because the online community really enjoys enjoys the editions. Yeah, the undulation in this one is beautiful. Yeah, lots of movement. Yeah, a lot of movement. Yeah. Another Marquis from the same collection. This one is called Luster Bird Trophy. So when it, when I walked to the client's house, I got to see the teapot and the bell and the noble effort and the other teapot. I got to see this bird on top of this piece. It's quite fun. Very um, Marquess-esque, if that's a word. <laughs> Very fun stuff. We have some of the collaboration works in the gallery that Marquess did with the uh, artist from Australia, whose name escapes me at the moment, but it will come to me. And you can totally see the relation. Nick Mount, you can totally see the relation between, you know, when Marquess puts his his style into the work, some strange things start to appear and they're very fun. <laughs> yeah. Incidentally, this is so unusual to have this many Marquises. I mean, normally we beg, borrow, or steal to try to get one piece in the auction. Um, and and uh, this is the most we've ever had. It's great. Yeah, at one time. 
and like I said, I'll be able to see some of his artworks in many institutions. So it's great to be able to have them in this auction. Uh, Colin Reed, an older purse piece from 1989. I just talked to him today about doing a Habitat Zoom next year, this, this year, sometime in February. We do rather well with his work through the gallery. And it's nice to see some of his older pieces up here uh, on the market. He's such a master of the casting process. And when, I, when we do have the visit to his studio, we'll be showing some of how he does this using a lost wax technique, or at least his newer work. And he plays with all kinds of um, ingredients, I would say, whether it's books or fruit or gets inspiration from so many places. And they're such beautiful visual explorations. Now, this is a piece I'd love to have a side shot from because this Joe Philip Myers is super big. It's 22 inches wide. It's only like two, almost three inches deep. So it's not that thick, but man, it has a presence. And looking at the colors and the tones, it is beautiful. It is probably, probably the best Joe Philip Myers I've ever seen. Because um, I've seen a lot of his work, especially from the time he started into the newer stuff he, he created. But when I saw this the first time, it just knocked my socks off. When we did get this piece, it was actually glued down because of the thinness, the person wanted to make sure it wouldn't be knocked over. And a little museum wax back in place would be able to do that for this particular work, but it is simply incredible. And he is a very, very important early on artist in the American glass studio uh, movement. And uh, this, yeah, I agree with you. This piece is really an extraordinary work. Right, if, if this doesn't sell, I'm gonna buy this in my personal collection. So <laughs> whatever you wanna do, everybody, just let you know. And uh, he's one of the artists that are really under the money right now and should be collected in, in fold because of it. Yeah. Paul Nelson just stopped by the gallery recently with his buddy, John Miller. And uh, this was a secondary marker work we picked up, I think in Idaho. And it is massive, 70 inches tall, cast glass, uh, yeah. medieval queen. It is just, and it comes with that metal base. He's one of the most talented bust makers did a whole series, right, for it of multiple people? Oh, yeah, Chihuly and Littleton and uh, various artists. I think he's one of the most underrated artists working uh, today. Uh, he's just brilliant at what he does. I mean, just the idea, the concept of the base being on wheels like that. He just, he does things that surprise you. And his talent is so great that, um, yeah, this, this should be, go to a, a good collection. Yeah, I agree. It's just, it's just a monolith. And that brings us to our Lubinsky in the show. If I could stop skipping ahead with my keyboard. There we go. Um, this is a penetration to the cone in the, in the professor's favorite color, a staple piece that, you know, is an important part of the history of contemporary glass. You get some oddballs here and there. Some people, I got an email recently asking me a bunch of questions about contemporary glass. And this is probably one of the most important forms uh, in, the, in the community. It's e easily recognizable, easily understandable, and in an important piece in great condition. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, uh, they're legendary artists uh, in, in many corners of the world, they're considered the, the, the very greatest working with glass uh, uh, that had worked with glass. Del Chihuly, of course, is always up there with all of his uh, innovations and, and his ability to produce uh, a substantial number of works. But uh, the Lubinskys, um, had such a tremendous influence on not only the artists in the Czech Republic, which cast glass was uh, pr the predominant way to work, but throughout the world. Yes, and like the way they perfected it such an early on manner, which taught so many other peoples and the people and the students that work under them are the, some of the most talented, worked under them are some of the most talented today, like Lachis or Boyajev, Vladimir Klumpar, Ivan Marish, I can go on and on and on. So mm -hmm. an incredible work by Lubinsky and Braktova. Another Paul Stankard work. We mix it up a little bit with the form here, having a cube piece, a simpler form from probably an earlier era. Let me see if I can find the year, 83. Yeah. So you're getting an idea of the narrative of Paul Stankard's work. So 
just a beauty. You're looking at, you know, the increasing ability of his talent over time. I just love you know, his work. I'm sorry. Go ahead. This piece um, was an early attempt at um, breaking out of doing the round paperweight form. Uh, Paul didn't want to be known as a, as just as a weight maker. He wanted to be known as an artist making miniature sculptures, really. And this was a great conduit for that idea. And this 1983 was makes it a very early piece that led to the one that's uh, in back of you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. It's a, you're looking at a path, right? A through time, baby steps. And like, you're all welcome to come into the vault and see the collection. Should you come see us here at Habitat? Because this is also from the Belkin collection. Uh, a newer form. So this was probably one of the most recent uh, pieces that, yeah, for sure, that Michael Belkin acquired. This is in 2017. So this was probably later on, if not one of the last pieces he collected from Paul. It incorporates all the things that people look for. You know, there's hidden bugs, there's bees, there's a beautiful botanical. This is the this is the overall form that people look for in his newest work. And we're honored to have one in this auction because it's very rare to be this new. And also, you know, this also falls into our policy. If the work at auction is less than 10 years old, a percentage goes back to the original artist. And we're helping the community and the artwork artists in that way. So I believe it's 3% of the hammer price goes back to the artist to continue him working because it's less than 10 years old. Something we do here at the gallery. Uh, recently, we learned about the passing of artist um, Michael Glancy. And he was an amazing, talented, incredible part of the contemporary glass art world, at working at the one of the highest levels, mixing in his electroplating and glass working. I had the opportunity to travel to his studio on the way to the Hamptons to do an art show with Corey when I was younger. And it was, it was a really great experience to see him in his, his I guess, nest and, and explore the machines. I had no idea what they did uh, to learn a little bit about him and his career and actually get a little one-on-one -on -one time. It was a lot of fun. And this is also from the Belkin Collection. Beautiful work. Not so elaborate as some of those other pieces, but just stunning in itself. Beautiful blue, blue tones. I believe it's um, yeah, eight inches wide. You'll see a lot of his work is very um, balanced. Not all of it, but this one is a very balanced piece. Vladimir Beer Klumpar, we were talking about the students of Lubinsky and Braktova. This is one of them. Master of the cast glass will be showing her work. She is part of the glass ceiling exhibition we have in Sarasota. Uh, I'm not sure what this is of. It looks like an abstract casting, but I'm sure there's some kind of meaning to it, a little bit of research I can do. But it is a beautiful, beautiful color and tone. And you can see the lots of movement. There's a line there you can see in the back panel of the glass. It's part of the piece, part of the casting itself. It's not a flaw in any shape or form. It is a beauty. I just love the tone of this piece. Bertil Valine, uh, many of you are familiar with his work. We did a Zoom last year with Bertil one-on-one -on -one talking about his history. This is kind of a rare example because usually you see these boats face up and you see them hanging. But this particular work is quite big. It is um, 40 inches wide. Um, there's lots of objects hidden inside of it, but you can't really see it unless you look through these little holes. You can kind of see there's a little hole window mm -hmm. there and there, and there's faces inside of it. And his work is about life and achievement and the path you're on. And this is just a different path than normal, but it's okay because that's what life's all about. People having their own path. And it's a lot of um, mystery with this particular piece along with achievement, which is usually what the house form means. It is just a beautiful work and it's very powerful too. We're getting close here. Uh, oh, Herb. So her Babcock local artist here, probably Ferd would say one of the first artists we've ever shown in the gallery. And he was here for our 50th anniversary. It's great seeing him. Retired from CCS, full-time artist. He sent in two works for our 50th international. Both, believe it or not, they look somewhat similar to this piece that was made back in uh, 94 and both pieces sold immediately in the show. So I figured- well, Herb, 
Herb makes, you know, maybe three or four sculptures a year. Right. So they're very desirable to get a hold of. And uh, yeah, that, that feeling, and I know you mentioned in the catalog about the balance. And that, that makes the work so exciting or so satisfying because as you look at it, it all seems right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his, his, you can talk at length with Herb about his work and about the meaning and about your, your vision, seeing things out of the corner of your eye, what they could be and what they are. But you're right for the, the balance in this work. And I think this work is an outdoor piece too. Such a, yeah. such a great example of this work. All right, Fern, you want to talk about this halava piece? You have a history with this kind of work. Uh, yes, uh, this is from our uh, first exhibition of Pava Halava in 1982. There's a uh, sister piece, I just looked it up, uh, in the Corning Museum. Uh, it's considerably different in terms of some of the interior, but it's the same size uh, and a similar composition as to this one here. Um, these, these were just so far ahead of what anybody was doing uh, during that era uh, that it is a you know, very, very significant work. We sold it to a local collector uh, who is uh, downsizing and, uh, and, and that's why we have it for sale. Thank you for, yeah, this is kind of one of my favorite kind of series by this artist and I've seen uh, this piece is a child somewhere. I think I was down in Florida and I saw it somewhere in someone's home or in a gallery and I was just taken aback about how beautiful this work was and kind of how it really gripped in the era of the glass world. It's one of the pinnacle pieces from its time. And I still think it's just an impressive work. Yeah. Uh, Flo Perkins. There's been a few of these at auction lately, I think, for it. I've seen them here and there popping up. We've had them in our auctions. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're fun. You know, sometimes you see them tall, sometimes you see them with one flower or two. I don't really know much about Flo. Can you enlighten me a little bit? Yeah, she, uh, she uses a technique where she uses um, silicone and uh, uh, applies these little rods in the silicone to hold the piece together. And that's a very good thing because there is movement in those little pieces. Otherwise, if they were static, they'd probably be breaking. But uh, she lives in the desert and obviously is inspired by the desert mm -hmm. and uh, does, has done a beautiful body of work. I don't see many pieces. I don't know if she's still working or not. I haven't seen new pieces in a number of years. Yeah, I, I see the desert, what you're talking about. So you can take a little bit of the desert home with you if you acquire this work. And yeah, she, a lot of people always ask about these, these works because they're kind of like a, one of the staples by the artists in this particular style. So great to have one at the auction. Uh, Giles mm -hmm. Bettison from Australia, still working today, a, a master of the medium. The, um, what is it called? Yeah. Marini. Marini, right? It's fused and blown glass matte Marini. And this is also from a private collector that was local. And he, this, but this is the only one I've seen in this shape in my lifetime. I've seen like sold cylinders, but I haven't really seen vases. And it's just an overall exquisite work. He's, he's like Australia's answer to Richard Marquess in terms of working on the Marinis, uh, obviously influenced by um, Venice and their uh, use of this technique. Yeah, yeah. And this he's piece great is at it. it's great. It's about a little under 10 inches tall and just a beautiful, beautiful piece by the artist. Aha, there it is. The last Marquess in the auction. The iconic. One, the iconic <laughs> teapot form that he's most, Richard Marquess has known most for uh, in perfect condition, just an overall beautiful piece. And it doesn't work, so don't bother trying to make tea in it, but it is, it is a beautiful <laughs> piece that are, are in high demand in this particular style. So lots of beautiful colors. You've seen, I've seen some of these pieces from earlier eras where they have like oranges and they're not as, as um, I guess, colorful. This is really the bee's knees, this one, and I'm looking forward to see what happens with it. And that would bring us to the final piece in the auction. So this is a hard venture piece. This piece is not going to physically be there. It's at the client's home who's selling it. 
Um, there's a big provenance about this piece. It was displayed at five different museums in its life before uh, the client ended up buying it and having it as home. And the, the client that's selling it is moving and is offering it this piece at an amazing start price of $20,000. Uh, first bidder could possibly get it. Just incredible. Fred, do you have anything to say about this yeah. one? This is a signature piece of Howard Bentray. It's um, illustrated on page 114 of the Hudson Press uh, book uh, entitled Howard Bentray. And it was in the collection of the Charles Cole, of Charles Cole, who had the Charles Cole Gallery. And that's where this collector ultimately acquired it from. But when I think of Howard Bentray and I think of the seminal pieces of his works, this is one of them. It's quite an extraordinary work. Yeah, it comes with a certificate. You can see some of the movement in the glass is actually part of the piece, the paperwork. Paper, paperwork references it in the original paperwork I have. It's just an incredibly piece. It is a, it is a heavy one. And whoever wins <laughs> this piece will work with an art handler to get it transported to your location. The seller has the original uh, palette that it came on and I actually have photographs of them installing it. So I'm looking forward to seeing who ends up with this piece next to their bed, uh, <laughs> for sure. What are the dimensions? Sure, the dimensions on that big one is, it's 42 and a half tall. 35 wide, 18 and a quarter deep. So it is quite the piece. And I had like, I, I comes with the original slide to the, the seller sent me everything that he had on it. Well, that wraps up the auction uh, dialogue here. And I hope you all have received your auction catalog. If you have not, call me. You can always go to habitatglass.com or the, let's get it straight in my head, the Glass Coast Weekend will link you there to see the catalog. Um, that we produce and sent out. It's, a, it's, a, it's quite a, a collection of work that we're really proud of and honored to have here at the gallery that we'll be finding homes for. We work with everybody after the auction to make sure things arrive safe and, uh, and smart. And if you like, you wanna place any bids, feel free to contact me at all, but thank you all for joining me today. Thank you Ferd for being here to have a dialogue with me about the history of these things because it's definitely needed. And I will continue to bring you in anytime I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everybody for joining me today. Uh, and I look forward to your questions and interactions. I'm seeing many of you down in Sarasota. It's going to be warm, I promise. Uh, and uh, I'll be down there with my whole family. And be well, guys. Have a great, great weekend. Take care. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you for. Bye, everybody. Bye, Steve. Bye.